Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Depends where are you now in this uh, place and there. First of all, I will introduce myself. I said, my name is Ahmed El Ziftawi. I am Egyptian. And uh, I am a mechanical engineer, graduated back in actually last, in, last century. I graduated back in 1983. And uh, since that time, I'm in oil field industry. Uh, I start my work with, with, with a company, American company called Utis. Utis has vanished now. There is no more Utis. It became part of Halliburton and then became Halliburton. Uh, <clears throat> I joined Schlumberger for a period of time, but uh, I'm working as a freelancer since 1995. But, uh, from 1985 up to now, my relationship with the oil field industry, I work in many branches in the field. I work in coal tubing, in wireline, in oil testing, in completion. And of course, in, in management and training. I'm a trainer since 1995. I'm approved instructor of uh, oil intervention. And I also teach coal tubing. This is uh, quickly who I am. I'm 60, 63 years old now. And uh, I'm here today to start with you uh, eight sessions. Each one is about 45 minutes. I always uh, tell Dr. Ahmed that uh, I hate talking to the computer, which is I'm doing it now. I always prefer when I teach someone that I can see him and he can see me. I can beat him and he can beat me. But uh, this is life. Yeah, and you cannot reach everything you need. So uh, I will be with you 45 minutes talking to the walls. <laughs> uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you will uh, get benefits of it. This is a course of well intervention. Who should attend this course? You guys. Uh, all engineers related, technicians related to oil field industry, they go to the field and they do jobs, witness jobs. They need to go for this course. What we're going to discuss in this course, we are going to discuss in well control, risk assessments, some phenomena like hydrates. We will talk about basic calculations of pressure, volume. We will go quickly through completion, accessories. And we will talk quickly also about coal tubing and wire line. Actually, each topic of what you see now is a big subject that we can talk months about. But we will talk about it in a few hours. Uh, before we start, uh, let us agree that we cannot talk about work control in 45 minutes. It, it needs more than that, but this is what the limitation I give to myself, actually, because after 45 minutes, you will need a break. I cannot talk for hours. So we'll go quickly on each topic of that. Today, we will concentrate on the well control, risk assessment, uh, hydrates, and maybe, maybe we can start uh, calculations of pressure and volume. Uh, after we finish, you might ask questions and I will answer any questions. I hope I can answer it. Well control. Uh, the well control starts actually from your character. And I always say that three factors govern the success of well control. And three factors govern the success of anything you do in your life. You need, if you need to fix your car, you have to send it to a good mechanic, number one. Number two, the mechanic should have the right tools to fix your car. Number three, he should have a plan 
how to fix your car. The same thing applies if you need to get a plumber in your house to fix some plumbing uh, in your house. The plumber should be a good one. He should have the right tool. He should know how to do it. In the oil field, it is the same three factors. Human, equipment, plans and procedures. And humans always comes number one. I mean, with, with the technology we have now that replaces human, still humans comes number one. Because we as a human who invent this equipment and tools. So that's why we concentrate on human a lot. And when we talk about human, uh, when I need to hire a supervisor in my company, uh, yes, he sent me a CV, one page or two page or three page. He's saying that he was the president of the United States for the past 15 years. And uh, well, that's great. But then you have to make an interview to have him face to face. And then you start asking questions to see if he can join your organization or not. In this interview, what we are looking for? We are looking for fitness, for example. That just, this gentleman should be fit for the job. And fitness, it is physically and mentally. In my life, I work with people who, uh, who is maybe 40 years in age, but he's a kid. We don't like to send kids to the field. We need to send growing men. And as I said, it's not by age. Physically, of course, he should be physically fit. That's why in interview, sometimes when I ask you a question, I talk that you can hardly hear. I'm, I'm testing your hearing. Can you hear or not? Your ears are working or not? Uh, I'm using the language because you have to speak common language. Number two is ask. Ask stands for attitude, skills, knowledge. Attitude, in a very simple way, it is an art of dealing with each other. It is how you deal with your wife, home, your servant, your boss, work, your colleagues, your trainees, your helpers your workers, it's an art. And sometimes when we talk about attitude, we have this slide. This slide says if the alphabetic, English alphabetic is A, B, C, D, then let us put A as one, B as two, C as three, and so on. Let's go for the word attitude. Attitude. Start with A, which is one, then T, which is 20, another T, 20. And if you substitute that, and then you, you will see that it is 100%. Yes, it is coincident, but it really represents the actual phase. Attitude is 100% we are looking for. I can teach you today how to multiply five by six. I cannot teach you today at your age how to deal with others. It's too late. Too late. It is in your blood. I can modify it, play with it a little bit, but it has to be there in your blood. Skills. When we send people to the field, we need to send people that they have skills. I always say that we have two types of people. Rock type and sponge type. The rock type people is like rock. You bring this rock, you put it in a pocket of water, you pass after a week, it is a rock. Nothing happens. The sponge type people, this sponge, if you put it in a packet of water, it will absorb water. This is the type of people we are looking for, sponge type. When you send them to the field, they gain knowledge. 
quit him. They are not strong. They will gain knowledge, but after 10 years, we are not, we are not looking for that type of people. We need a sponge type. This is what skills me. And we need people that we have knowledge. Knowledge is not experience, actually. Some, some people believe that knowledge is experience. And this is what I hear from my boss in the old days. You need knowledge, Ahmed? Go to the field. You will get experience, which is knowledge. But the fact is, I went to the field. I gained experience. I gained knowledge. But many of this knowledge I gained was totally junk, totally wrong. They taught me in the field that when I connect two hooses with a quick coupling, and if this quick connection uh, is dirty, no problem, you bring a bucket of diesel with a paintbrush and clean this quick coupling connections it will be shiny then you can connect male and female together i did that this is the knowledge i gained but when i gained the knowledge from a reputed places i found out that i was doing a fatal mistakes number one i was cleaning the quick connection with diesel when I connect the male and female, what makes the seal between the male and female? It is the rubber. Diesel is an enemy to the rubber. It destroys the rubber. So I was destroying my safe way of connecting. It will leak because rubber should not be exposed to diesel. The second mistake I was doing when I clean with diesel, connect them together, time after time, the hydraulic oil which is supposed to go through this hydraulic system, it is not hydraulic oil anymore. It is a mixed grill. It is salad. It is cucumber, tomatoes, and lettuce, and onion. It, is, it became hydraulic oil plus water by default. Plus diesel, because these traces of diesel that goes every time I clean with diesel, it goes to the system. It, the hydraulic oil will be contaminated. I didn't know that till I gained knowledge from reputable places. So a lot of knowledge I gained in the field was totally wrong. So please, when you get knowledge, try to get it from reputable places. Knowledge is very important. Team effort. When I select someone to join my organization, he should work in a team. Superman and Rambo, they do exist in Hollywood movies only, but not in reality. Yani, do not ever believe that. Gentleman can go to Vietnam, uh, fight alone an army of 2,000 soldiers. In 10 minutes, he killed them all, and he get injured in his arm here. This is in the movie. But in reality, it is a team. If we accept that uh, maybe uh, Ronaldo and Messi are the best player in the world, if I bring both of them and work in the national team uh, that I like in Egypt, no one will hear about them anymore because they are not, they are not the best player in the world because of themselves only, because they work in a team. The team has to be good. The whole team, it, it has to be this kind of harmony between the players. Otherwise, it will not work. Some people, they can work alone, but they cannot work in a team. They are useless for us if they cannot work in a team. 
democratic approach. We're still talking about the character of the person that we need to hire. When we come to this point, democratic approach, we always say that uh, dictatorism exists up till today. Yani, I cannot have a meeting in the morning before we go to the work, which we call it free job safety meeting or toolbox talk. We cannot have a meeting and uh, let us vote, gentlemen. Should we go to the field today wearing a helmet and coverall, or we go to we go with the slippers and shorts? And if the majority agreed that we go today to the field with shorts and slippers, then this is democracy. No. When we talk about safety, you have to be a dictator. This is how it works. Take it or leave it. We are going, we have to wear helmets. If you don't like that, you go home. You have to be a dictator when we talk about safety. But when we talk about recreation, you have to be democratic gentlemen. And the, the best example described what I'm saying now is the toolbox talk or the this safety meeting we do just before the job. After we finish what I need to discuss as a supervisor or a man or in charge, I should not just, okay, gentlemen, let's go to work, start the work. No. I have to listen to the feedback of my guys. And uh, the word we are using, I like it a lot, which is uh, not just listen to the feedback but it is encouraging feedback, encouraging feedback. So after I finish, okay, gentlemen, or ladies and gentlemen, uh, um, any question, any suggestion? Then I have to move with my eyes to your eyes, guys. And if I see someone who is ashamed to say something, or I should encourage him to say it. And if what he said, is for the benefits of the job, I will change my program accordingly. Encourage it. This is democracy. This is democracy. When we talk about operation, please use democracy. When we talk about safety, please be a dictator. Communications, coordinations, as I said, if you are the best one for this job and you have experience, vast experience in this, but you don't speak English, I and we are we are working in uh, in, in Abu Dhabi or Dubai with multinational team. If you don't know, if you don't know English, I can, you cannot join my team. How you communicate? There is no way. Uh, responsibility. We need people who can take responsibility. Some people, by the way, they, they hate responsibility. They don't like it. I mean, they always believe that they have to be in the, in the second level or third level. So someone is above them who, who will take this responsibility. But this is not the right way. Because when I hire you today as a supervisor, when I hire you today as a trainee, I'm hiring you as a trainee today, but tomorrow you should be you should be the chairman of this company. If you cannot reach that, then I don't need you. I call you a helper now because yes, we, we need helper who is 15 years experience in cutting sacks of senior, for example. This is the helper. He will stay his life as a helper. If you need to hire someone to, be, to get benefits of this one, that you start him as the trainee, to be operator, then supervisor, then engineer, then field supervisor, field manager, uh, operation manager, chairman. This is a different story. We need people that they will take responsibilities. And when we 
This is generally how we select people that we need. And uh, how to select equipment that we send to the field? We should know what we send. <laughs> yani, it will be funny, actually, if, if I have a wireline supervisor in the field and I'm the company man, and then I call him, uh, hi, Layla. Uh, do we have gauge cutter 2.4? And then he's... Laila reply, well, boss, I, I don't know. Let me check the toolbox. If I am in the field, as a company man, and Laila said that, what I will shoot, I will shoot here. Because you should know everything you have in location. This is, by the way, well controlled, because when I need it, I will need it now to save people life. Independent inspection. All equipment we send to the field, it has to be certified. Certified for the period and for the type of job we are doing. Yani, the equipment is certified till uh, the end of this year. But the job I'm doing is H2S. Is the equipment certified for H2S or not? So it's not just period, but type of job we are doing. Uh, without an inspection, without certification, we will not be able to send the equipment to the location unless it's certified. And uh, I need you guys. It is, it is, it's not a matter of, of filling a file with documents. And I remember one day back, 19, I think, 88, 87. I was working in Abu Dhabi that time. I was just a little operator. And uh, this story, it's an actual story that uh, one service company, they went to the location, they spot the equipment. And then the company man, who is the owner of the representative, arrived to the site to check the equipment before they start rigging up on the Christmas tree and run in the hole and start the job. When the company man arrived at the location, he went to check the equipment. So he had this tour. When he finished, he went to the supervisor that time. And he tell him, he told him, thank you very much. Please take your equipment and go back home. The supervisor was, was really surprised because what mistakes he did. He didn't even start the job. What went wrong? What was wrong? It is mentioned in the report of the company man. In the report, he mentioned that. He made the tour to check the equipment and he found that none of the fire extinctions on location in good working condition. Although all of them were certified. I don't remember how many, but let's say eight fire extinctions. The eight fire extinctions on location were certified and inspected, and they're still within the period of certification. But none of them is in working condition, meaning one is empty. It is certified, yes, but empty. It has been used, no powder inside. One of them, there is no handle. One of them, there is no gauge, or gauge is broken. One of them, there is no uh, hose, whatever. But none of them is in working condition. So it is not the matter at the end, it is not a matter of certification, a piece of paper that you put in the file. But you have to have a visual inspection to be sure that the equipment is fit for job. Machine suitability, the equipment I'm sending to the field, does it meet the requirement of the job? I'm sending a cold tubing unit uh, to run in the hall to 15,000 feet, but I'm sending pipes. The total length of the pipe is 13,000 feet. It will not reach the depth I need. 
Uh, I'm sending a pumping unit, which is rated for 5K, 5,000 PSI, uh, to do an integrity test of the Christmas tree to 10,000 PSI. <laughs> it will not fit, right? I'm sending uh, standard service equipment, but the location I'm going to do the job is h 2 So the machine has to be suitable for the job I'm doing. Pressure test and function test, of course, we have to do that. You have to have backup and spares. Preventive maintenance. If I'm a company man, and you are a service company, before you get your equipment into my location, I will ask you, would you please park it outside and bring me the file? When you bring me the file, this is the file of the unit. It should consist of partitions. One of these partitions is the maintenance. If I open this maintenance partition and found out that the last time you do the preventive maintenance for your equipment was uh, three months ago, what I will do is I will close this file. Thank you very much. You see this door outside? Would you please go out and close it? I will not accept that equipment. Three months, you didn't do any maintenance for it. And I do, should I rely on this equipment that they will do a job? Of course not. When we talk about a toolbox talk or a pre job safety meeting, this is a meeting where we do it. We do it. In location. And he, I asked this question one time to my candidates, in one of the course. Where do you do this meeting? He said that while going to the job, and he, they are sitting in the double cabin, or a two cab, double cabin ticket. Then while one of them is driving, they start talking about the job and how they're going to deal with the job. I said, no. What you were doing is chatting. This is not a bridge of safety meeting. You were chatting together. But the bridge of safety meeting should be on location. Why should be on location? Because actually, if I'm sitting on the Christmas tree, doing the job, and I'm doing the meeting on the Christmas tree, not on top of the Christmas tree, around the Christmas tree, I mean. Uh, if you guys see a Christmas tree, you will see like a hole around it, a bit around it. We call it cellar. If the cellar is not covered with grating, steel grating, I will, not, I will not do the job because it is not safe. During the job, one of my crew might fall in this hole. If I'm doing the job and I'm around the Christmas tree doing the safety meeting, and I found that... <clears throat> We are on the Christmas tree, which is dual completion, which means that it has short string and long string. And I'm supposed to do the job on the short string. And I look at the Christmas tree while I'm around it now. There's no tags to identify which is which, which is the short string, which, is, which one is the long string. I will not do the job. So what I'm saying that why this meeting has to be on location, because your point of view as a client, when you put the program, how to do the job, might be different than mine as a service company, how to do the job in reality. So that's why it has to be on location. Who should attend it? Everyone. Everyone means if I, I have someone who makes a good coffee for me and I decided to bring him with me to, to make coffee, this gentleman has to attend this meeting. Everyone has to attend the meeting. Where we, when we do it, it is just before the job. So everything is fresh. What we discuss, we discuss all what you see here in blue. Job in details and in simple way. We discuss risk assessment. Risk assessment, what's the risk assessment? We have to discuss during the job, we might face this problem. 
if this problem exists, this will be how to solve it. If this happened, this is how we solve it. If this happened, this is how we do it. If this happened, this is what, this is what the risk assessment. So when the problem, a certain problem arises during the job, then the solution is ready from day one. Safety on site. This is our wind sock that we have to, this is our assembly point, and this is the distribution of our extinctions. Housekeeping, that we have to keep housekeeping all the time, avoid injuries and fatalities. Responsibility. We have to decide who is doing what. Who will sing? Who will dance? Because if we go to the location, all of us dance, who will sing? We need a singer as well. So we have to decide who will deal with the Christmas tree? Who is dealing with the company man? Who will give signal to the crane operator? Who will run the unit? We have to assign responsibilities. Who is doing what? Otherwise, we are, we are in a circus. This is what we call pre-job safety meeting. Barrier. This is a big word in our field industry. We cannot live without it. Because actually, what kind of well-serviced disaster could happen Caused by pressure, blow out. And by the way, this word you see, pressure, P-R-E-S-S-U-R-E, -E -E, this is our nightmare. If we don't have a pressure, we don't have any problems. If you look at the root of any problem that happens in the oil field industry, you will see pressure somehow, somewhere. Our dream is to do the job at zero PSI. If we succeed in that, this is, we are in heaven. Pressure is what, what caused the blue out. And the blue out happens because the barrier you are using failed to protect you or to prevent this pressure. So what causes the blue out? A failure in your body. What is the equipment used to control it? Well, no, it is the barrier, as we said. Then we come to the definition of the barrier. It is any device, fluid, or substance that prevents a flow of a war in well bore fluid. I don't like the word fluid here. I wrote it myself, myself, yes. I like liquid. Because fluid, actually, the word fluid means either gas or liquid. Normally, we, we cannot use gas as a barrier because it does not create hydrostatic heat that prevents the, the flow of the world more fluid. So normally, I should say liquid. So it is any device, fluid or Substance that prevents the flow of the world war. Like what? Like Christmas tree, wireline plug, a DOB, which is blow out preventer, like stuffing box of the slick line or wire line, uh, the stripper of the cold tubing, uh, the fluid, the shear seal DOB, a DHSV, which is downhole safety valve. Uh, I don't know, guys, are you familiar with what I'm saying? Like when I say stuffing box, when I say wire line, or I say cold tubing, I don't know if you study it or not. But let, let me have this feedback when I finish today at least to see are you familiar with what I'm saying? Or like down horse the wall, do you know what's down horse the wall or not? Uh, wire line plug, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, but these devices, which is written in green, these are devices we use to prevent the flow of a hydrocarbon from the well. When we say fluid, uh, 
I should have a, an explanation here because this fluid, if we are using fluid, which is the liquid, I mean, this liquid should create hydrostatic heat greater than the formation pressure within a certain limit. If we exceed that limit, then I will frag my formation. So, anyway, uh, if the formation pressure is 3,000 psi, you cannot bring a fluid that creates hydrostatic at 6,000 psi. Because this is extra pressure, it will destroy, it will break your formation. So it has to be within two, 300 psi. And it has to be monitored all the time. If you cannot monitor the fluid, yeah, what do I mean by monitor? That you are sure that I mean, what created hydrostatic heat in the fluid is the density values. The density and the total depth, the vertical depth. So if you are using fluid, liquid that creates density of point or 8.5 BBG, pound per gallon, you have to be sure that it is always 8.5. That's why at the surface, we always take samples from this fluid to be sure that its density is 8.5. For example, uh, if you cannot monitor this density, then this fluid is not the barrier. You have to be able to monitor. We classify barrier into three categories, primary barrier, secondary barrier, tertiary. Normally, when we do a job of slick line called tubing, when we run in the hole, we run in the hole with a primary barrier closed. So if I'm running wire line or called tubing, I always have stuffing box, which is the rubber element, that seal around this wire or seal around this pipe while running in the hole or pulling out of the hole. This rubber, that it prevents pressure escaping out to the surface. This is our primary value. If it fails, what should we do? Use our secondary value. But to use the secondary value, first thing you do is you have to stop the operation. None of any other barrier can work while in motion. The only one who can do that is the primary. But any other barrier you use, first thing to be able to use it, you should stop movement and then apply your second. If it fails, then you go to the tertiary. And as I said, any, any other barrier, we use, if the primary failed, we should stop the operation, stop movement up and down, and then close the second gap, or close the tertiary gap. We don't close them to continue the operation. We close them just to be able to fix the primary barrier that failed. And I need to explain what do we mean by fail. I mean, if you are running slick line and during the job, your primary barrier is closed, which is the stuffing box. If the stuffing box is leaking, leaking means there is oil coming out, gas coming out. Then this is not failing. This is leaking because you can increase the pressure on the stuffing box to squeeze more on the slick line or the coil tubing so it will prevent the scaling. Hydrocarbon. So when it is leaking, you increase the pressure on the element, so it seals. But when I can say that this stripper rubber or stuffing box failed, when you apply the maximum pressure you can apply, and it's still leaking, now it is failed. This is the time that you have to stop the operation and use the second. If the second barrier, which normally the, the VOB blowout preventer, if you close the blow-up preventer, still leaking, then the second rebellion fail, then you use the tertiary. Any barrier, 
what I wrote, green any barrier can be classified as primary barrier as long as it prevents the flow of hydrocarbons. Because actually, if your primary fails, and keep in mind that primary barrier is always, it is the only barrier that can work while in and out. All other barriers, all other barriers, to use them, you have to stop the operation first. And you use them temporarily till you fix your primary barrier. If you cannot fix your primary barrier, you cannot resume your operation. And if a primary fail, and let's use an example of slick line. If the primary failed, which is the puffing box, then you stop the operation, close the secondary barrier, which is the blue out prevent, UV, close it. Now, the BOB you close, and it seals and prevents the hydrocarbons. This BOB, which was the secondary barrier a while ago, now it is the primary barrier. And it remains the primary barrier. Till you fix your stuffing box and open your BOB, now your primary barrier is your stuffing box, and the BOB return it back to its original job, which is secondary barrier. If the secondary barrier, which is the BUB, both use our tertiary barrier, which is the Christmas tree. We use the upper master valve, which is, it has the cutting capability of cutting the slick line. Cut and seal. If you use the upper master valve to cut and seal, now it became a primary barrier because it is the first defense of line, defense line that prevent this escape of hydrocarbons. So the barriers plays this game, they, they work together. Tertiary barrier could be a primary barrier, temporary, till you fix your primary barrier, and then it returns back to its original job, which is secondary or tertiary. Uh, the BOB is, is one of the main barriers. That's why this BUB has to be certified. When you buy a BUB brand new from the factory, it gains with a certification valid, for example, for one year. Before the end of this year, you have to recertify this BUB. Recertify means that you have to bring a third party, a proof third party, to witness the pressure test you are doing for the BUB. When you do the test of the BOB for the purpose of certification, and let us assume that this BOB, which is in your hand now, it is rated for 5K, meaning that it, 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 its working pressure is 5,000 PSI. Now we need to test it for the purpose of recertification. When we test it, should we test it to 5,000, which is the working pressure of the BOB? or to a higher level, or to a lower level? You need me to repeat the question? I will. Now I have a BOB in my hand. This BOB is rated for 5,000 K, 5,000 PSI, sorry. I need to pressure test it for the purpose of certification. When I test it, should I test it to 5,000 PSI, which is it's working pressure or, or a higher pressure or a lower pressure. Of course, I will not hear your answer. I'm not, but uh, I'm giving you a few seconds to think before I tell you the answer. The answer is when I test it, I should test it based on a standard I'm using, international standards. The most famous international standard we are using is the API. API stands for American Petroleum Institutes, which is like FIFA in the football. And he, <laughs> I cannot come to play with in your country, and then you prepare your team, which is 11 players, one plus 10. But then I play with 15 players, one plus 14. Can I? 
course I cannot. Because FIFA put a standard. It's one plus 10. This is the international standard. So when we pressure this, this VOB, we should refer to our standards. If we are using the API standards, what the API is saying, the API is saying that the relationship between the working pressure and test pressure, the minimum is 1.5. 1.5 means that this BUB, which is rated for 5,000 PSI, when I test it for the purpose of certification, I will test it to minimum of 7,500 PSI, 1.5. If the test is okay, the third party, which is audited this test, he will issue you the certificate. When you look at the certificates, when you read it, you see that this BUB is rated for 5K, 5,000 PSI. There is nothing will be mentioned about the 7,000 PSI I use. But he might say in a separate paragraph or the last statement on the certificate that this has been carried out as per API standard. Then you know that we tested to 7,500 PSI. Now, let us have this uh, BUB which is tested to 7,500. And we issued a certificate that it is rated for 5K. And let's take to this BUB, take it to the field and rigged up on a Christmas tree. My question now, we will do a job on this BUB. What is the maximum pressure I can apply to the BUB? What is the maximum pressure they can apply to? Is it 5,000 or less or more? Think a few seconds before we answer. Some people say you can test it to 7,500. No. The maximum pressure I can apply to this will be 5,000. Why, Ahmed? Yesterday, we tested to 7,500. So what's wrong if I tested to 6,000? So, no. The difference between the working pressure of the UB, which is 5,000 PSI, and the 7,500 we use to recertify this BUB is 2,500 PSI. This is not for you to use in the operation. This is to save your life in case of emergency. So this BUB, which is rated for 5K, the maximum test pressure I can use in the field is the maximum working pressure, which is the 5,000. That's why one of the questions, which is really nice, please listen to what I'm saying. Now you need to perforate. So you, you rig up your E-line, you test your pressure control equipment to 5,000 PSI. You run in the hole, the hole is full of mud, and you reach it a depth of 12,000 feet. And then you perforate. When you perforate, the surface pressure gauge you have reads 5,020. My question now, should you continue operation or not? Pressure test equipment, again, you use, you test it before the job to 5,000 PSI, it holds the pressure to 5,000 PSI, no problem. You run in the hole, the hole is full of mud, and you reach 12,000 feet length, and you perforate. When you perforate, the surface pressure that you have on the gauge, it reads 5,020. Should you continue the operation or not? People who say, yes, we can, although we test to 5,000 only, they said, okay, yeah, but you know that when we tested for the purpose of certification, 
We tested to 7,500. So 20 PSI extra is not a big deal. Yes, let's do it. The people who has the knowledge and who have this, the safety sense, they, they will say no. They will say big no. Because this BUB is tested to 5,000 PSI. You cannot use it for any one PSI extra. And they know that the difference between the five and 7,500 is for safety, not to use for the operation. So the answer, of course, you cannot continue the operation. And uh, if you ask me what's, what should you do, then uh, I said, what do you think? So some of you, of course, if we cannot continue the operation, then we pull out of the hole, go to the swap valve and change this pressure or do this to or bring a, a bigger, a higher rate equipment. I said, no, this is not a good answer. Because now, if you need to pull out of the hole, you need two hours to pull out of the hole. You are exposing the area to a hazard situation for two hours. Your equipment is tested to 5,000, and now you have 5,020 for two hours. Hazard situation. If you ask me what to do, I said, Cut the wire, drop it, close your Christmas tree, you are safe now. Then people start crying. Do you know what you did, Ahmed? How many dollars I paid from my pocket? You need me to destroy the job? Cut 12,000 feet of wire. And the, perforate, the perforation job I did and paid for the perforation company, all this will be gone with the wind like that? Just for 20 PSI? I said, yes, I'll do that for one extra PSI, not 20. Only one. So when we talk about safety, please do not talk about money. We are talking about life of people. Money is nothing. Uh, in this example, it say what can happen when you unset a retrievable bridge plug and don't have Enough weight above. The retrieval bridge plug, it is a plug. We run it with the wire line. It has a rubber element, a rubber element that inflates. So we run it through production tubing. We go out of the production tubing into the casing. And when we set it inside the casing, this rubber element that inflates and set against casing walls. To do a certain job. Once we finish the job, we retrieve this bridge blood. That's why it is a retrievable pipe. Before we retrieve this bridge blood, what is the first thing we should do? We should equalize. We should equalize the pressure. If we didn't equalize the pressure, because normally you have maybe 2,000, 3,000 below the bridge block and zero on top. If you try to pull it out this case, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see a blue out. And uh, what you see on the, on the grounds here, this is not a cold tubing pipe. This is a drill pipe. This is three and a half inch completion tube. Uh, we destroyed the environment. This is one of the impact on the flow out. The impact on the flow out, number one, it is life loss. People will die. Number two is what you see now, environmental loss. Number three is financial loss. Number four, reputation. You lose your reputation, right? These are the pipe. You see, these are the joints. These are three and a half inch pipe. What brings it up to the surface? Pressure. Pressure. And this is the bridge block. 
that you retrieve it before you equalize the pressure. Where we find it? If you have a measure tape to measure the distance from the bridge plug all the way to the rig, it was 400 feet. Uh, sorry, 400 meters, almost half kilometer. 400 meters. This bridge block was not here. It was many thousand feet below. So actually, this bridge block is the barrier. But you misuse it. So if you misuse the barrier, it will create blowout. The API recommendation of any barrier that we said a minimum of two tested and available barrier, regardless of the type of operation. And regardless, your job is work over, drilling, uh, call tubing, wireline stopping, a minimum number of barrier you are using as two, as a minimum. That's why we, as a well intervention, and by the way, the word intervention means act fast. Because in well intervention, while we are using with uh, working with wireline or call tubing, we are working on a life wells. So your decision should be very quickly in part of a second. Even in drilling, drilling when you deal with, normally you are dealing with dead well, sometimes if your decision is not that fast, you will create blowout. Because if you have a kick, for example, when you're drilling and if you have a kick, which is the intrusion of gases into the system, that reduces your hydrostatic head. So it turns your status from overbalance to underbalance. So uh, gases start coming out to the surface. And you notice that? That means your primary barrier failed, which is the mud you are using. Then you have to use the secondary barrier, which is the BOB. Then you push the bottom for the BOB to close. This BOB to close, it will take time to move from the opening position to the closing position. It takes Minutes, hours, seconds, it takes seconds. How many seconds? Maximum 30 seconds. Sometimes this 30 seconds is too much and blowout happens. So 30 seconds, this is when you deal with dead well. What about life wells? You we are dealing with part of a second. That's why your decisions should be very very, very quickly. That's why in one intervention, we normally use three barriers. So during the job, if one barrier failed, we're still within the umbrella, under the umbrella of the day, we had at least two. That's why we always use three barriers. What makes me cry that I have been talking for almost one hour now and which is the, the limit of our uh, lecture. So you will, not, you will not get annoyed from being listening for more than one hour, especially that you are watching a screen, you are watching, not watching a live person who's arguing with you and you argue with him. Uh, it's four o'clock and I didn't even finish with the, the barrier that I need to finish. But uh, Dr. Ahmed, I have to stop now. It's one hour already. And, uh, uh, Engineer Ahmed, uh, thank you very much. And for sure, we will see you again uh, on Wednesday. Correct? Uh, correct. But if there is any question that uh, you need me to answer, tell me. Now, do, you, do you have time to take some questions now? Uh, I have time. Yani. I have no problem. Yani. I can. If you have questions, yes, I'm ready to listen to these questions. Okay. So uh, I have a question from Arafat. He's asking, what about temperature? Any effect? of any uh, importance? So I, I, I didn't hear you, Dr. Ahmed. He's asking about the um, temperature. The temperature, let's say, in, for the um, killing water or whatever you are using, the temperature, is it has any effect or not for, for controlling a well, for example? Tem temperature? Yes. Of course it has. Of course it has. And the, the, the typical example of this when we, when we drill a, a new well, this well is high pressure, high temperature. And after we drill the well, we perforate and we are ready to produce from this well. 
before you open the well for production, I tell you, please, your eyes on the gauge on the casing side, annulus. Why? Because high pressure, high temperature. If it is a high temperature well, when you start producing from this well, this high temperature will be transferred through the production tubing to the fluid in the annulus. If the fluid in the annulus, its temperature raised, this will raise its pressure. And you will see that this remarkably on the gauge you have on the annulus, which is the, the annulus between the casing and the production tube. If this pressure exceeds the mask, which is what we call a maximum allowable annulus pressure, you will have a blowout from the annulus. So the relation between pressure and temperature, if you increase the temperature, you will increase the pressure. And of course, if you reduce the pressure, the, the temperature, you will reduce the pressure. So increasing the temperature will increase the pressure. So of course, temperature has a major effect on the pressure. And that's why it has to be monitored during the job. Yes. Okay, a second question, uh, someone asking what will happen if the pH is uh, in the dwelling fluid less than seven. If the pH of the fluid is less than? Seven, like acidic. We cannot talk about numbers. We are talking about hydrostatic heat. When we work, if we are using the fluid as a hydrostatic barrier, based on the calculation, let us say the density we are using has to be whatever, uh, nine. If, the temp if while doing the job, the density of the fluid, it is less than what we calculated, which in our example, nine, if it became eight, 30 or eight, this will turn us from overbalance to underbalance, which means that the fluid we are using is not a barrier anymore. And this is a disaster, disaster. The last question, uh, someone asking what is a slick line and what is a stuffing box and what is yes. the, the, the function? Yes, the, uh, the slick line, it is a service we do after we turn the well from drilling site to production. We use the slick line, which is uh, a wire, a solid wire, stainless steel, attached to tools, with tools, that we run it inside this life well to do a certain jobs, like opening uh, sleeves, uh, uh, putting a plug to prevent the hydrocarbons. Uh, uh, sometimes we test the production using a slick line. So we use it as an intervention method uh, we will talk about it in, in, in lecture number five, I believe. Uh, we will have samples. I will show you samples of the slick line. And the stuffing, lock, the stuffing box of this slick line, it is a rubber element that seal around this slick line to prevent the hydrocarbon escaping out during the job. Engineer Ahmed, uh, thank you very much. For sure, we will be waiting to uh, attend your class again on uh, Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day. Sure. See, you, see you Wednesday. See you. Bye.